Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? I picked up an iPod that's definitely seen better days, but instead of just fixing it, let's check out what's involved in making this thing even better than when it was new. So I snagged this fifth gen iPod as it was heading out for recycling. This is also known as the iPod video. If you're curious about the entire iPod lineup, I'll include a link to a video I did that's kind of a buyer's guide that explains all of them and their pros and cons. This particular generation is one of the most popular ones for people to upgrade and modify. So this is a fantastic opportunity to see just what's involved and what the options are. But this particular one has some problems. The most obvious ones are cosmetic. Like you can see this weird kind of cracking, scratching on the faceplate. I'm not sure if that's from a major impact that this thing took or if it's just like some really deep gouges from something that was rubbing up against it. And of course, it's also got the very typical scratches and wear on the chrome back. I don't think there's a single iPod out there that doesn't have at least some scratches on it at this point. So that's very common. And both of those are easily fixable. The other thing that's going on with this one is another major common problem with these. And that's just due to their age. The battery is pretty much cooked. This unit does still function, it wakes up, it works. However, after charging it overnight, you only get like 10 minutes worth of runtime out of it. Um, so definitely the sign of a failing battery. And not only can we replace that with a new one, but we can also get even better runtime out of it using modern parts. So that's gonna be something fun to investigate. The other thing though with this one is a part that hasn't failed yet, but probably will, and that is its hard drive. This is a 30 gigabyte model, and like all iPods from this series, it's a mechanical hard drive. You know, iPods, they'd get quite a bit of abuse during normal wear. You'd carry them around and accidentally drop them, throw them in a bag, that sort of thing. And well, the hard drives inside these are like a pinnacle of miniaturization technology. It's just insane that they were able to get so much data on a drive so physically small. So hard drive failures in classic iPods is just an incredibly common thing. The best path forward for that isn't to put another hard drive in, but rather to convert it over to flash storage. So that's gonna be the other part of the major upgrade we'll be doing to this one. The modding and repair scene for these classic iPods really reminds me of what's going on for things like handheld game consoles, Game Boys and the like. There are a lot of vendors and there are a surprising number of third party replacement parts and upgrades available for them. This thing has its own cottage industry surrounding it. And so there's a lot of really good parts that you can get and a lot of places you can pick them up from. I happen to buy all of my parts from Elite Obsolete Electronics. This is not a sponsored video. I paid out of pocket for all these parts. I was drawn to that site because it's kind of a one-stop shop for picking up iPod parts and there's a lot of good information there as well. I think they've even got a YouTube channel with some tutorials on it. But do your homework and shop around, of course. There are a wide variety of parts available. Some of these are really good quality parts and some not so much. So doing your homework as to what's the best option for what you're trying to accomplish is going to be a good idea. The same as if you were modding a Game Boy, that sort of deal. But what I picked was a decent selection of parts that's not going to go too crazy in terms of like making this something completely unrecognizable as an iPod, but also kind of lets us explore what these mods are capable of bringing to the table. So the first thing we've gotten here is a new click wheel, and you'll notice it's a different color. It's actually a color Apple never shipped, a white one. I figure the white one, eh, a little bit different, just to kind of at first glance make the iPod look a bit more unique. Um, I also picked up a brand new front panel, of course, because this one's just way too scratched. So nice fresh one there, undamaged. A new battery, and we'll talk about batteries a little later on when we get to installing it. I also picked up a metal spudger, believe it or not, I didn't have one of those. And then two more really cool parts. The first one is a new back. 
And this is also a color that Apple didn't really sell. I wanted to go just a little bit different with this one, so this blue kind of caught my eye. And there's two sizes to the metal backs for this gen and some other gens of iPods, and we'll also talk about that. But the star of the show is going to be this guy. This is what's going to replace the mechanical hard drive inside the iPod. There are actually many different varieties of these based on how much capacity you want and what type of media you want to use. This is one of the more simple ones. It basically pretends to be a hard drive, but you stick an SD card in it instead, and that becomes your storage medium. So now you've gone solid state, it's a lot faster, it's gonna be way more reliable, and also a bit future-proof, because if you want to expand the storage, you don't have to worry about trying to find another part, just grab another SD card and swap it in. So before we can install any of this stuff, we need to get the old iPod taken apart, so I guess let's uh, see what's involved in doing that. It's been forever since I've taken one of these apart, but it's pretty straightforward if I remember correctly. You definitely want to use like a metal pry tool or spudger of some sort. The plastic ones just aren't thin enough and sometimes they can break off or just not really give you the leverage that you need. Um, take the pointy end and it just kind of goes in a gap between the front panel and the metal back. Um, I should also note if you are not planning on replacing the housing, like if all you want to do is open up one of these to swap the battery or swap the storage or whatever, probably wouldn't hurt to cover the outside with like masking tape or something uh, just to protect it, you know, along the edge and then along the front because you might slip and scratch it and that would suck. So in this case, I don't really care because <laughs> I'm literally replacing both the front and the back, but you just kind of work it along and there's a series of clips on the front panel that attach it to that rear housing that you're just trying to kind of work loose and as you kind of slide along you can you can get them in here snapping popping noises you know as you work them free that sort of thing i don't think it's uncommon to end up like bending the pry tool a little bit in the process these are surprisingly tough and there's a reason why i'm doing this to a fifth gen not just because i've already got one of these but because these 6th gen ones, and you can do all the same mods to these 6th gen ones, these suck to open up. Like, they just straight up suck, and that's because the front panel is made out of metal on them instead of plastic, so the clips are just a nightmare. I have no intention of doing any sort of work on these unless I absolutely have to. These 5th gens are just so much nicer to work with. And we are in. You do need to be careful because there's a couple of ribbon cables that still attach the front to the back. It's because Apple decided to glue like the battery to the back and then of course you've got the headphone jack and the hold switch that connects. So you just need to get in here and very carefully kind of swing the back cover out of the way and then you can pull the battery cable out. Should give you a little more room and fold that over. Alright, so the battery is disconnected. This is the cable that goes to the hold switch and the headphone jack. It's kind of covered where it connects to the motherboard by the hard drive, so that's the thing to pull out next. I like to just flip it over like this, and you can see there's a flat flex ribbon cable that connects it. We're actually going to reuse that ribbon cable. There's nothing wrong with it. So then you uh, simply get in there with like a fingernail and flip up this black latch they call that a bail and the hard drive just comes free like that and so now we've got the motherboard the screen and then the uh the headphone jack and then you kind of do the same thing to free it you flip the bail up using a fingernail and then the cable just gently comes out try not to break the bail because there's otherwise no way to secure the cable in there and if you drop the ipod later on it may pop free or whatever so be careful but at this point like the hardest part is kind of done the hardest part really is cracking these open and you can see it really isn't that difficult on these fifth gens now if all you're doing is swapping the battery and the hard drive you don't have to do anything further to the front panel but because i'm replacing the front panel and the click wheel there's a bit more disassembly that needs to go on you can see along the side here there are screws there's three on each side they're little phillips head screws and i think it's a number double zero driver that you need all those screws need to come out 
And then before we can release the metal frame from the front panel, I'm also going to go ahead and disconnect the LCD cable. This one's kind of tricky because there's not a whole lot of space between the bail and that little part of the metal frame, so you might have to go in here with the spudger very, very carefully and just flip that up. Again, don't break it, otherwise you're in trouble. And I'll just use it again to kind of get under it here. This is probably not the best tool to do that with because these kind of have sharp edges on the sides and if you tear one of these then you're done. Although that is worth saying, if you break a screen, if you break a motherboard, it's not the end of the world. You can buy replacements for those. The motherboards obviously you can only get used parts. Uh, there aren't any like third party brand new aftermarket iPod motherboards out there. But you can buy replacement screens if yours is damaged or cracked or the backlight's dead or whatever. Um, you can basically at this point build an entire iPod from component parts that you buy individually if you want. I don't think there's much value in doing it that way. I think you know, just taking an intact unit and swapping out parts that are bad is going to save you a lot of money. But you can get replacement parts for stuff that you break <laughs> in the process of doing one of these mods is, I guess, what I'm trying to get at. And everything just kind of falls out like that. So the click wheel stays attached because it's got its ribbon cable that goes into the back of the motherboard there, and that stays on the frame. Here's the screen. Good chance to clean this before it goes into the new front panel. There's the entirety of the new front panel and then the center button fell out. So let's get this sorted with the new parts and then we'll move on to things like the battery and that storage replacement. So since I'm replacing the click wheel, we need to get it disconnected. It actually hooks up on the back of the motherboard, but because it's routed kind of around the edge of the PCB and under the frame, it's pretty much impossible to, you know, remove from there and stick the new one in without removing the motherboard from the frame itself. Um, so a bit more disassembly to do here. I believe the trick really is to just kind of gently start to push it out from the back. You'll have little pieces start to fall out like little plastic pieces. This one fell out earlier. That's just to kind of cover around these sides, but it's just like double stick taped to the frame, although it's really strong adhesive. So you just got to kind of be gentle. And as you're removing the motherboard, you'll see the click wheel's also got kind of a little tab here that sticks to the frame. I'd like to say that's some kind of like proximity sensor thing. Um, I just tore it because I don't really care. I'm replacing the click wheel, but this can be a little tricky because it's double stick taped down to that frame. You may have to get a spudger or a craft knife or something to peel the entire thing up. Um, again, I don't really care because, you know, I'm replacing the click wheel, but that's just another thing to keep in mind. Another part of the uh, click wheel assembly here. This you don't want to damage. This black piece that clips to the, or tapes to the frame rather. There we go. Alright, and with it like this, so you've got access, you can flip this plastic bail up for the ribbon cable. The ribbon cable is obviously the orange piece, the green of the PCB. And then, of course, they double stick taped the flat flex to the motherboard on this side too. So you just gotta go in there and gently peel it up. And then you can slide it out without damaging that connector. All right, so here's the new click wheel that we're going with. This manufacturer does include new double stick adhesive on the back, which is pretty nice to see. The trick with that is you've got to get it connected before you let the adhesive stick. Sometimes that's easier said than done. All right, so that's in the connector. Flip the bail back down so that's latched. And then now this whole assembly can go back into the frame. Doesn't look like they included any new adhesive on the back of that little T piece, that sensor for the front, but the frame still has pretty strong adhesive, so it just it just sticks back down. All right, let's get the screen reinstalled. I'm reusing the original one. There's nothing wrong with it, so we just kind of 
get this back into place and again it just kind of fits in the right spot you notice these two tabs on the lower corners of the screen they fit into notches on the front of the frame and then you just kind of hold it in place with your hand around the back side and get the cable reconnected all right new front panel before i do that i'm going to clean that lcd because i probably got some fingerprints on it just using a uh, like microfiber kind of cloth here I don't think I got it too bad but if you do have like lots of dirt and fingerprints and whatnot on here now is the time to clean that up otherwise it'll be very visible when you go to use the thing I've also got the new home button here or center button rather home button I'm thinking iPhone and that just fits into the middle of the click wheel uh, you could go with a different color if you want that's kind of a cool possibility for customization option but so that fits down like that and then here's the new front panel I'm gonna leave the plastic on the front until the very end but it does have this middle bit around the screen cut out that we got to remove and that just peels out I'm gonna not touch anything on the inside of that because otherwise it's just gonna get fingerprints on it and then I think the trick is gonna be to try to assemble this right side up this is probably like the most fiddly part I wouldn't call it difficult it's just a little bit time consuming to try to kind of get all the parts to line up the way you want that click wheel is always a little bit difficult so you know how I was saying at the beginning that there's a whole bunch of these third-party replacement parts and the quality is kind of all over the place well here's a little bit of that variability you may run into the first thing that I'm noticing with this new front panel and click wheel is that they're slightly different colors. Unfortunately, the click wheel is a little bit more yellow than the front panel. I can live with that, but the other problem that I'm finding is that this front panel isn't completely snapping onto the frame all the way around. Like it gets 90% of the way there, but the screw holes don't completely line up on both sides you've got to really squeeze it hard to get them to line up and I don't like having to do that what I realized is going on is there's a minor difference between the uh, screen cutouts on the new front panel and the original Apple one so what I've noticed between the replacement panel and the original one is the thickness of this white plastic is different. It's thinner on the original panel than on the replacement. And that causes the depth of the screen cutout to be different. There's less space for the LCD panel on this replacement front than on the original. And that's why this isn't snapping on completely. I hate to do it, but I think the best path forward is going to be to simply remove this black gasket. That should free up a little bit more Z height for that LC panel to fit in correctly and not like feel like I have to really squeeze it down when putting those screws in to keep the whole thing together. All right, so it's not perfect, but it is better. It's a bit of a bummer. I kind of wish I could have just reused the original front panel and that it wasn't so scratched up because I'm just not really super happy with the quality of this replacement. Um, I'm sure it's kind of just the same thing like with replacement Game Boy shells. You know, some of them are really good quality and some of them are not. And it's hard to know until you get it in your hands and try to assemble it. But this will work. This is, uh, this is going to work just fine, I think. Obviously, this old battery needs to come out. And if you take a look at it from the side, kind of hard to tell, but it's starting to swell up a bit, which probably partly explains why it only lasts for like 10 minutes. So this thing was definitely due to get replaced anyway. All right, so that leaves us with the headphone jack and the hold switch. You look carefully, you can see they're held in with some screws. So it's just a matter of getting in there with a screwdriver and very carefully getting those screws out without stripping the heads. I am wishing I had bought a replacement headphone jack because it looks like this iPod may have taken a spill at some point because the plastics are a bit broken. See this tab that secures the headphone jack? That broke off the side there. I don't think it's the end of the world because I still have this screw 
that can go in and secure it and maybe I can get real lucky and glue this back together but this part is like maybe 10 bucks you know I could probably also maybe put a little bit of like double stick tape on the back of the headphone jack to stick it into the new housing as well that might work but yeah that's a lesson learned that we both learned today I guess all right one more screw for the uh headphone jack and hold switch assembly it's the silver one on the other side and then you got to carefully peel up because of course apple decided to double stick some of this ribbon down gotta kind of carefully get under some of this flat flex and peel it up hopefully without damaging it so again maybe just buying a replacement one is the way to go One last piece to transfer from the old housing, and it's this plastic ring that just goes around the dock connector on the bottom. Uh, it is held in with two screws on the inside. These are also very cheap. I decided not to buy a new one because mine's in still good shape. Although a lot of times these do end up getting cracked or broken off just through wear and tear. So buying another one may not be a bad idea. All right, and here's the new back panel, blue on the outside, kind of purple on the inside. I'm not sure why, but pretty straightforward just to swap those other components in. Gonna be honest, I'm not thrilled with this headphone jack situation because the plastic bits, the mounting tabs on either side broke off. My best guess is that someone dropped the iPod with headphones plugged in and it like tweaked the jack. I think electrically the jack is still fine. It worked just fine before I took the iPod apart, but I did end up using a little bit of double stick tape on the back side of this, plus what's left of the one mounting ear on this side with a screw to hold it in place. I'll probably long term just buy another one of these cable assemblies and swap it in. But for now, this should be fine. All right, now let's talk about the major part of the upgrade that we were going to do today, and that is replacing the hard drive with a flash storage solution. So this is the iFlash Solo. There are other versions of these and other manufacturers, of course, as well, and they all can take different kinds of media. I've seen some that are just real simple compact flash card adapters because this ultimately internally is just an IDE interface and compact flash uses the ATA protocol. So you can get a real dumb cheap adapter, throw a big compact flash card in one of these. SD cards gets you cheaper access to larger storage media, of course. 128 gig compact flash cards are a lot more expensive than SD cards, at least these days. Plus, they've got higher end versions of these adapters that can let you either do multiple cards, in which case the adapter will kind of like treat them like a RAID array. Like it'll take all the cards capacities, put them together and present that as a single disc to the iPod. So you can do some like just stupid large capacities. I think Dank Pods did like a two terabyte iPod once using one of those adapters that supports multiple SD cards. I've also seen some that'll take like M SATA SSDs. I've decided to go with just the SD card version. I'm just gonna drop a single 128 gig SD card in there. There doesn't seem to be much in terms of compatibility issues with the cards that you pick. That said, each of these adapter manufacturers seems to have a good listing of the cards that they know will work and some that they know will not. So maybe check that first before you go out and buy an SD card. Otherwise, the best advice that I have to give from other things that I've seen people say about these adapters is stick with a class 10 card or better just for good performance. If you decide to play lossless or uncompressed audio files, Sometimes the slower cards may not be able to keep up. So here's a tip that I picked up from people who have already done this mod. Even though the slot on this SD card adapter has that latching style where it kind of goes in and clicks, it's still possible for the card to slide out. Is that a concern with normal use? No, not really, but there are some worries that like if you were to accidentally drop the iPod, the card may get loose or come out on its own. Some people will take these foam pieces and stick one on the adapter behind the card to hold it in place. And that's a great idea. 
However, in my situation, I'm not going to do that. And you'll see why, because there's going to be another thing that's going to go in and eat up all that space. So I'm just going to physically tape the card to the slot using some capped on tape. That way it won't slide out on its own. And it's still easy to remove if I ever need to go into this iPod and swap it out for whatever reason. Okay, and with that done, we can get the iFlash connected. Very similar arrangement to with the original hard drive. You just unlatch the bail on the ZIF connector there and carefully try to get that ribbon cable seated in there evenly and correctly and then just latch the bail down and there you go. Oh, and before I forget, I'm going to get the screws put back into the sides of the faceplate here just to hold it to the frame. Okay, the final piece of the puzzle here is the battery. Which one you choose is also going to dictate potentially which back and storage adapter you go with or vice versa. What I mean by that is these original size batteries are meant to just fit into the top of the iPod like up here, right? So that leaves plenty of room for the original hard drive or a flash adapter or anything like that. In that case, if you're going to stick with one of these smaller original size batteries, the back is really not going to be a factor. There are actually two thicknesses for the backs on the fifth and sixth gen iPods. And in fact, that was a thing with even the previous gen ones as well. The reason for the two thicknesses is because it came down to the capacity of the hard drive. That's giving you some options, however, if you wanted to explore putting larger batteries in as part of one of these upgrades. Maybe you've got a smaller capacity iPod, like this one was a 30 gig and that came with a thin back, but you wanna put as big of a battery as you possibly can into it afterwards. So that means you can go with a thick back that you would use with a larger hard drive and just fill up that space with a big battery instead. There are some really good resources online that kind of explain all the different like permutations of battery size versus storage adapter versus the back thickness. The storage adapter can play a factor based on where the components are located on the board. In this case, because it's basically just PCB from the SD card on up, that's a lot of space. So I can go with this 2000 milliamp hour capacity battery and it's gonna lay in there something like that. So it'll not only take up the space of where the original battery was, but a little bit more. This, as I understand, is the largest battery that you can put in a fifth or sixth gen with the thin back. And I intentionally wanted to go with the thin back just to make this thing as sleek and you know pocketable as possible. I've seen some, I think as large as like 3000 or so, and they end up being like the full size of the back of the iPod. So that's clearly where you need to go with the thicker back panel. But this one I think is gonna work out really well. I'm debating about whether I wanna tape the battery in or just leave it loose. I have a feeling that everything's gonna fit in here snug enough where it's not really gonna be an issue in terms of like flopping around or whatever, but Maybe putting it in the back and then a little tab of double stick tape, nothing super strong adhesive, just to hold it in place wouldn't be a bad idea. I've gotten everything just kind of loosely connected. I'm not snapping it down just yet. Let's see if it wakes up. Hopefully the battery's got some juice in it. So that's a really good sign. The SD card is blank, so it wants me to hook it up to iTunes to restore it. Hardware-wise, I think we're in good shape. I'll go ahead and snap this one together. We'll get a really good look at it, get it wiped, put some music on it, and test it all out. Here's some few people that are into this kind of thing. So yeah, this thing turned out awesome. I'm really happy with the end result, the fingerprints on the back notwithstanding, it looks brand new, which is kind of what I was going for. And I should have realized this at the beginning, but this thing weighs a lot less than it did before I started. And that's just because of taking out the mechanical hard drive, even swapping that for the flash card adapter and the bigger battery, this thing still weighs less than it did before. 
One thing that I should note has to do with the storage capacity. So I went with that 128 gig SD card. There is a practical maximum as to how many songs you can copy to an iPod. And long story short, that all has to do with this little database that's on the iPod that gets updated when you sync music to it from iTunes. That database is what's used to feed information into the different categories, like if you want to sort by artists or albums or songs or genres or anything like that, it's what lets those lists populate really quickly. The problem is that database can only be so big. And what can make things confusing is that the size of the database varies based on the model of iPod. So some iPods can hold more total songs than others. You can figure that out by going into settings and then about and then looking at the bottom. That'll give you the model number. And I'll include a link down in the description to a really convenient table that kind of explains if you have this model, here's the maximum number of songs that the iPod can handle. From there, you just kind of need to do the math and figure out, okay, if you have this model of iPod and here's the maximum number, what kind of files do you typically listen to? Obviously, MP3s and AACs are going to be smaller file sizes than lossless like Wave or Apple lossless. So for me, 128 just kind of seems like a happy medium. In the end, all the parts that I put into this thing cost me about 100 bucks, not including the cost of the iPod itself. Of course, that price is going to vary based on how far you want to go. Easily half of that price that I spent on this was just for cosmetic things. The click wheel, the, the front panel, the back panel, that sort of thing. If you've already got an iPod that's in good cosmetic condition, yeah, maybe 50, 60 bucks. It can be a lot cheaper. You don't have to spend a ton on this. And I know ultimately some people are going to ask, hey, I'm not very handy. Can someone else do it for me? Yes, there are plenty of places out there that will build you custom iPods. And again, it just comes down to what you're looking for. Prices seem to kind of hover around 150 bucks or so, but they can go up from there. Anyway, if you like this video, I would appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.